Welcome to News Talk with Simone Ivani at the International News Channel. As the elections draw closer, it seems as though the Liberal Party of Canada has lost its advantage to the Conservatives. Erin O'Toole's Conservative Party is currently enjoying 33% of voter support, with Justin Trudeau's Liberals falling closely behind at 32% support. Meanwhile, the NDPs under Jagmeet Singh have 20% of voter support. And although the Liberals may have called this election to obtain a majority, the current trend suggests that they may just be disappointed with the election results. Specifically, recent polls from Abacus Data show that dissatisfaction with the government is rising, and only 41% of Canadians hold a view that the country is moving forward in the right direction. This may be in part because of the rise in COVID-19 cases, due to the Delta variant across the nation that has forced Canadians into a fourth wave of the pandemic. As it stands, however, the Liberals' dream of a majority government appear to be moving further and further out of reach. Joining me today to further discuss the upcoming elections are my fellow Inc. TV hosts, Julia Cosby and Ava Blackwell. Thank you for joining me, ladies. Thanks Thank for you having for having us. Yeah. So, to start off, I want to talk about one of the less talked about parties, so the Green Party of Canada. They performed well in the 2019 elections. So given the months of chaos that has engulfed them, how do you think the Greens will fare this time around? That's a great question, Simone. And Anami Paul, the leader of the of the Green Party, stated in an interview a couple weeks ago, I believe, she said that the two defining challenges that Canadians are facing right now are to build a social safety net to allow every Canadian to live in dignity and security. And the second challenge is how to tackle the existential crisis that is climate change within Canada. With emissions on the rise over the last uh, reign of Trudeau, it's going to be a big thing for them to tackle. Well, as you know, there's a lot of uh, strife within the party. I feel like their own party is their worst enemy. All this fighting within their own party. And also, one thing I'm very surprised about is because all of these big parties have their platforms that include climate change, why isn't the Green Party poking holes in all of their points? They're at the, the biggest advantage right now. They mm -hmm. started as a smaller party where that was their main topic and now they're at the advantage where everyone agrees with them for the most part and they're not they're not taking advantage of that as much as i thought they would yeah they're not grabbing the proverbial bull by the horns no i agree and with climate change too i feel like that's one of their main things but like also speaking like that's not the only thing that's that you need to run a country i guess so i'm not sure how they're going to do it quite frankly either but this election season has seen its fair share of controversies too. So the first campaign ad which seemed to rub Canadians the wrong way was brought to us by our very loving Conservative Party who produced a Willy Wonka spoof of Justin Trudeau. Have you guys seen it, first of all? Yes, I've seen it. I yes. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, okay, first of all, I'm not a big fan of most of these uh, political videos or like propaganda or anything to promote any of these parties. Uh, most of them come across as pretty cheesy or shall I say cringy. So uh, this is like every other one, uh, to me at least. Mm -hmm. I, I find it completely cringy, but all of them I find cringy. So it is just in the list of cringy political ads. It's cringeworthy for sure. For sure. Uh, don't uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Did they launch that commercial before they revealed their full platform? I think so. Yeah, the I feeling so. for me was that it was retaliatory yeah. and a defensive action mm -hmm. uh, on the part of the Conservative Party, and it, it just it felt very um, like I was like, are we in junior high here? Yeah, people. Why right. are you spending time and money and valuable resources on this? It didn't look like it took too much. No. It, 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 it took too much time, but like I mean, I'm like you wasted a lot of effort on this, people. And uh, I mean, to be fair, they kind of had this election thrown at them, so they were reeling. But it no. ultimately gave Trudeau more face time yeah. in front of the public. Yeah. I don't know. It was sort of free publicity. They kind of state that any publicity even bad publicity is good publicity so yeah. we'll see well I don't we'll see I didn't love it I understood maybe where they were coming from yeah. but I didn't agree with it no I think I thought I personally just thought it was very childish too yeah. like you said we're not in junior high and if anything it's just it makes it there are other ways to show the country what you don't like about Justin Trudeau without trying to make it seem so childish yeah um, so on in your opinion was this a smart move on the part of conservative party no no no, I mean, it bought them time, I guess. Yeah. Maybe they had other things going on that mm -hmm. we didn't know about. So yeah. if they were covering else, something else up, then it was a smart move. But otherwise, no. Yeah. It wasn't. 
Deep Speak, oh, go ahead. No, no, go oh, ahead. No, they've been very careful um, throughout, even for the last year, all of 2020. They've been very careful and very well planned and very well coordinated about everything they do. Um, I feel like even in the leadership race, they were very careful to mm -hmm. just make sure everything was very seamless. So I was surprised that this ad actually came out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But speaking of the campaigns in general, it wasn't just the conservatives who are accused of mishandling it. So liberal incumbent Chrystia Freeland was accused of misrepresenting conservative leader Aaron O'Toole's position on privatized healthcare in a manipulated Twitter video. However, liberals argue that this clip is in fact representative of O'Toole's stance on healthcare. So same question again, have you guys seen this video first of all? So I've seen the video and I think Christia uh, Freeland could have just posted the actual video or posted a link to the actual video mm -hmm. unedited and right. let everyone decide for themselves. Obviously the hardcore fo liberal followers are going to agree with a lot of what she says. But one thing I found very interesting is this already exists. Yeah. The liberal party is already privatizing healthcare. If you go to get blood work done, that, that's a that's private health care. Mm. Um, the government's subsidizing it. The government's paying for it. Um, you have your health card that you show, but th it's already happening. So mm. I'm seeing some like uh, some hypocrisy, and uh, I just find it interesting that her government is already allowing that to happen. Yeah. Uh, yet she's she's picking on Erin O'Toole. Yeah. I think for me it was also the same situation, but she is the deputy prime minister of Canada. So when someone in such a position is uploading some sort of or manipulative video for that matter, I'm not sure if you guys know, but Twitter also flagged the video as manipulative media. So I'm not sure what she was trying to accomplish by that. And if anything, it just kind of may have just backfired on her. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what their intent was with it because posting the whole video would have actually worked in their favor. Yeah. Were they just trying to save time and, and, and get audiences to view it, like viewership up by ha posting a shorter video or were they in fact trying to manipulate the media? It just didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, it seemed like, m to me, it just seemed more like an error, like a lack of thought or like an Im impulsive kind of thing impulsive, that I'm, yeah, exactly, yeah right yes. exactly so building off of that though the conservative government's position on a two-tiered healthcare system has facilitated some important conversations about the role of privatized healthcare in Canada do you guys think that privatized healthcare or options for private healthcare is, is in the best interest of all Canadians well I will say that I would definitely not want to be a poor person in need of health care living in the United States of America that is uh, that's all I'm going to say <laughs> yeah fair enough fair enough uh, is that, that your final answer that's my Julia? final answer okay, okay. All right, all <laughs> that's right. all I'm gonna say I mean it to your f earlier point Julia Medicare has been or uh, health care in Canada mm -hmm. has been like slowly been privatized over the past few decades and although Medicare is a source of pride to Canadians it like given the the way it performed over the last year through the pandemic it's really in question right now as to whether it is the most effective mm. way to go about it the core values of Medicare are universality and accessibility and studies have shown that um, privatizing healthcare and private financing affects those core values, but doesn't affect the overall healthcare outcomes in a positive mm -hmm. way. Though, going forward, Canadians have to uh, determine what our values are and where we want them to be, because right now, Medicare is sort of reactive and it's not preventative. In my experience, it doesn't seem like they care whether I'm blind and toothless, because nothing is covered, well, barely anything is covered in the way of dental or optometry, mm. which leads to a lot of, if, if not taken care of on a regular basis, leads to a lot of other healthcare issues as you age, which puts a burden on the system later on. Mm. So I don't know if it's a matter of privatizing healthcare or just sort of shifting where the existing resources are currently allocated. That's actually fair enough. I, I, for me, I guess I just I'd agree that it might be in the best interest. Like when you privatize healthcare, you're creating competition, and when you're creating competition, you're creating space for better services, upgraded services. Mm -hmm. So, I think that might be my stance on it. But we'll see. I agree. I agree yeah. with you. And just to further that point, if you've had to wait in the ER any time in the last 
decade in Toronto, you begin to question, or if you've been on the list for a specialist mm. uh, oh, in, yeah. in any re region, you can just go across the border and get it taken care of within 15 minutes. They yeah. just swipe your credit card and it costs an arm and a leg, but is it costing you that much in, in the time you're waiting time. and paying out mm. for certain things in the Canadian healthcare system? To your point, Julia, I would not want to be a poor, no. like I would not be wanting to live at or below the poverty line in Canada without the existing healthcare systems. I'm so grateful that it exists. Yes. I just, I don't think it's as effective as it could be the way it currently stands. No, that's fair enough. And speaking of healthcare, as we are all very well aware, this election is occurring in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Fourth wave. In an attempt to get back to normal, many private and public organizations are now implementing vaccine mandates. Would you prefer to see a leader in power who supports it or one who opposes it? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, everybody looks at me. <laughs> I mean, it's such a slippery slope, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Because what we decide now and what we are deciding through our action or inaction determines the fate of our future very directly here in this, mm. in, with these decisions due to, as far as I understand and as far as my research has shown me, mm. currently the privacy laws that are in place in Canada make it very difficult for governments to enforce vaccine passports mm -hmm. and mandates. Yeah. And it is sort of a greater good scenario. And it's easy for me as a person in good health and good standing who's working a lot and contributing to the economy and needs to be out there mm. as a performer, as a broadcaster, as yeah. an essential worker, um, now that <laughs> entertainment is considered an essential, essential service. Yes. Um, to say yes, we should very much uh, enforce this. However, the other part of me says, well, what if, what about people who are immunocompromised, who for mm. whatever reason can't have the vaccine? Right. What is their quality of life gonna be if we enforce these mandates? And then in the future, when another wave of the pandemic, uh, a different, or a different pandemic hits, and we just start to have to get more and more and more vaccines in order to do anything, what are the ramifications of these decisions mm. now? I agree with you as well. There's so many things to consider and it's really hard to just say er everyone gets the same treatment because that's not a quality. Uh, different people have different situations. This is really about the person uh, and their doctor and their decisions and their decisions for their own health. And this is really creating like a two tier system. And so conversations that should be with the doctor are being made by an employee that uh, works at the front desk of a store or stands at a door and they are the grand judges of whether you get into something or you don't and it, it's really hard for especially like those who have uh, all, all of these issues, underlying issues or they're allergic to ingredients and it's really, it's really yeah. unfortunate that it has to come to that, that I think some of the leaders should be a bit more open-minded mm. to all kinds of scenarios. And um, we're, we're not really seeing that with the liberals this time around, which is interesting because they're, in the past, seem to be a little bit more open-minded to a lot of different things, but for this one, they're not. Mm. Mm -hmm. I guess I wanna agree with there. I personally think that it's the choice of, a Cana of the Canadians that they wanna take it or not. Um, once I feel like once you start forcing someone to do something they don't want to, we are moving away from Canadian beliefs and values. Mm -hmm. I is, completely yeah. agree with that. Yeah, but it's like we were those beliefs and values set in place before we had those this situation. Yeah, this unprecedented. Because right. is a lockdown uh, like according to our beliefs and values? Yeah, like, is that right. Our no, that's fair choice. I, I, I don't know the answer to this. It. I don't think anyone has the <laughs> yeah. answer. It, it's, it's a very broad yeah. question to be fair. Um, but recently. The Liberals have fallen one point below the Conservatives in voter support. Why do you think that might be? Why do you think that voters are shifting their attitudes towards the Liberals? I think the Conservatives have just been rolling with the punches. Anything that's thrown at them, they've been delivering beautifully. Um, whereas some of the other parties, um, they have some scandal. They have some unprecedented things that have come up that they weren't expecting. And I feel like this time around, the Conservatives are the most organized out of any party, uh, which is surprising because the Liberals did call the election. So you'd think that they would be the most organized. Uh, one right. funny thing that happened um, presidentially uh, this week is the NDP government. They went to Manitoba <laughs> and uh, there was a chief who who was on stage with Jagmeet Singh. And he, uh, he actually um, told everyone that he was he was for the liberal candidate, and uh, that's where his support uh, 
led, and um, I, I thought that was pretty pretty interesting. Uh, speaking of little scandals <laughs> or little things to pop up. Um, but I also think as well, the conservatives this time around have been more um, open-minded to like social issues, where typically the liberals had really the advantage, for example, like LGBTQ uh, rights and everything. Mm -hmm. You see the conservatives, they're, um, they're talking about paupers, which I think is, you know, really something I, I didn't expect them to bring up. Um, just all these, all these different social issues, even climate change now across the board, that used to be like a fringe party with the Greens, and now it's across the board. All parties are accepting it. So I see a lot of open-minded uh, perspectives coming from all parties this time around, and things that may be issues that people didn't vote for conservatives they were, they were pretty opposed to voting for conservatives before because mm -hmm. they didn't share those perspectives. I feel like conservatives might be gaining votes this time around because conservatives are more open-minded. So that I, I find that interesting at least. Fair enough. Ava? That's a great answer, <laughs> Julia, and I <laughs> echo many of your sentiments. Yeah. Um, I, I think also there's the issue of Canadians have just been through such a traumatic and uncertain time, and while there were good things that the Liberals did uh, to help us out during those times. They seem to be clawing back on certain things and changing it and we really are looking for somebody that we can trust right now and because of all the scandals that the current party has mm. sort of had uncovered and played out, uh, we're looking for that, that strong voice, that strong leader that we can really depend on to get us through this these next few times, you know, yeah. as we recover from financially, emotionally, mentally um, from this this pandemic. I agree. Um, as we talked about last week as well, trust is what is riding this election. And with Trudeau, as you just mentioned, scandals and all that fun stuff, corruption and stuff, it's, it's, it's not working for him. He still looks great, don't get me wrong, six years later, but it doesn't work that way, I guess, anymore. Um, and I guess the final nail in the coffin, as you also mentioned, with the pandemic. Him calling an election during the pandemic is what really may have jolted everyone for that matter. As the Delta variant has thrown Canadians into the fourth wave, do you think that voters' confidence in the Liberals will continue to deteriorate? I think so. I feel like there isn't uh, so much of a plan for those who are double vaxxed or have gotten uh, an additional vaccine in the future. And what are they going to do in the winter when those who are du double vaxxed or triple vaxxed are still getting COVID and the numbers start rising and rising and rising? I feel like this current government doesn't have, or at least I haven't seen a very big plan for that and what happens next. And I feel like there's a lot of distrust and I feel like it's more so just blaming those who are unvaxxed or have a single vax, but I, I, I really think there needs to be a plan B and a plan for those who have already been fully vaxxed or triple vaxxed uh, leading on to the next wave and what they're going to do and what their plan for, for them is. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, Part of me wonders if Trudeau even wants to win the next election with with everything that's been going on. I mean, if I was him, I'd be exhausted by now. I'd be like, somebody please take the reins. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, right. that's, oh my God. So maybe, I don't know, maybe underneath this all, he has to put on like the bravado of wanting a majority, but underneath it all, he's like, somebody please take my spot. Because that's what his actions are kind of showing, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, like I said before, in all, in all seriousness, uh, Canadians are really looking for the person that they can trust the most, that strong presence that's going to follow up on what they say. Their actions and their, and their words are congruent with each other and they line up and they can help get us out of this next stage because we've been working hard collectively. We've all been trying to do our best to contribute to the economy as much as we can. We've been wearing our masks. Most of us has, have been going and getting vaccines when and where we can. We've been following the news. We've been doing what we can. So we need our leadership um, to do the same. Echoing right off of that, we are going to change our line of thought and we're going to talk about the housing crisis. This is something we talked about last week as well. And we are in the midst of a housing crisis and this has been a focus for election campaigns across party lines. How do you want the leaders to handle this crisis? 
You know what I love about all these parties is I don't have to share my opinions. I don't have to make these uh, tough calls. Those parties can do it for me and I can pick and choose which, uh, which issues I relate with the best and which answers I agree with the most. Mm -hmm. So um, th that's my thought on, on this whole thing. They can come up with answers, they can do the hard work and um, I can choose the best one I, th I see fit for myself. And uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it just seems like promises, promises, and who's going to deliver, and that's yeah. truly what it always is in a campaign. But uh, the Liberals were promising last time that they were going to put things in effect and into play to help with the housing crisis. And although yeah. they did put the the foreign tax on in Toronto and everything, mm -hmm. it didn't really seem to do much. Slowed it down a little bit, but there were a lot of loopholes that everybody found quite quickly to get around it. Yeah. Um, according to the World Economic Forum, the countries with uh, the highest mortgage debt in a housing bust, uh, they have deeper and longer recessions. And we are kind of, I think Canadians are all fearful that we are on the, the edge of a huge economic recession just because of what the economy's been through in the last few years. So I don't know, the party that comes up with the best plan to uh, to, to put supplies in place for, for housing and affordability in place for housing and, and shows that they're coming through on those actions, they're the best fit. Yeah. And I think O'Toole is talking about banning the foreign funding here well, as well. Liberals are as well. Liberals are as well? Yeah, okay. liberals are. They're all kind of, as far as I've seen, just on my preliminary research with the housing crisis, they're all sort of promising the same thing. I think they're all just piggybacking off of each other at this point. One's promising and they're just kind of adding on to their promises. But let's see how it goes. And that brings us to an end. Thank you so much for joining me, ladies. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. And thank you to our viewers at home for tuning in. This is Simone Ivani with Ava Blackwell and Julia Cosby. You're watching the International News Channel on Tag TV. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to stay up to date on all the latest news.